Hello everybody, welcome back. Santa Miller here and today we are talking about 2020's The Invisible Man, finishing up our run of Invisible Man movies that we're looking at here in October. Don't worry, I'm not going to do this bit the whole time. <laughs> I had to do it once, you know? I had to throw it in there. <laughs> so, this movie... Hold on, I gotta turn on another one. Uh, this is the first of these that I had seen in theaters. And I remember being surprised and impressed with how actually terrifying this is. Uh, but, uh, we're gonna get, we're gonna get into it. I got lots of notes. And, uh, we are gonna talk about, as we have with all of these, how easy this invisible man would be to fight. Uh, because according to Nando from Nando V Movies and the Mostly Nitpicking Podcast, he thinks it would be quite easy. This one, well, I don't want to spoil my, my thoughts, but we'll get to it. First note, cool credits. I loved the credits when I first saw this, and as soon as I started rewatching it, I was just like, oh yeah, they had cool credits in this. And it's like, you know, credits can be really boring, and sometimes they can be really fun, but it's, I think, kind of rare that you see kind of a semi-serious, spooky, scary mo you know, a movie that takes itself pretty seriously doing something interesting with the credits. And I think that's, I think that's neat. I think that's cool that they did that. Uh, why is she doing all this at night? So the film starts with Cecilia enacting her plan to escape from Adrian and like I'm all for that no problem with that I just don't understand why she's chosen the middle of the night to do this we're, we're told a bit about how he controls her and controls when she can leave the house and stuff like that so maybe it you know if it was during the daytime he would have been able to like see her moving around in cameras or know that the access codes were used or, or whatever. So maybe it had to be while he was asleep, but it, it seems like the fact that if she makes too much noise, she could wake him up and that would ruin the whole thing. It seems like that's an unnecessary risk risk. I misspoke an unnecessary risk. Maybe it's not it just feels kind of weird, but I do like that. We get right into it right away. We're with this character. Um, just seems a little a little bit odd. Uh, camera on nothing. So I wrote this early on, but it it's a it's a major part of the whole film throughout. This is one of those techniques that very easily could have been done wrong. Like when I did it, right? Because I'm dumb, I'm not a filmmaker, right? It it's it would be very easy to just put the camera on nothing. And have it feel like nothing, right? But, like, the way they do that in this movie, where it pans and it moves and you're looking back and forth and all the empty space, and it does a great job of making you feel like there's someone there. Now, a couple, a couple things here. Throughout the movie, there are a couple clues to know when... The Invisible Man is actually there and when he's not actually there. Number one is that the suit makes noise, right? Now, I didn't really pick up on this because I was watching with headphones because I watch almost everything on 1.5 speed, but not everything has the sound play correctly at 1.5 speed. I swear things were fine for the past couple years that I've been doing this, but when I started doing my Phantom of the Opera stuff earlier this month, something was weird and I tried tweaking a setting and then like since then it's been very hit and miss. So I don't know what I messed up and I don't know how to fix it, but some of them are fine and some of them, the sound won't come out of my TV properly at 1.5 speed, I have to use headphones. And when I'm using headphones, I don't have a way to crank the volume. They can only go as high as the headphones can go, and it's not that loud. So I didn't really pick up on this. I read about it in the IMDb trivia, but there was another thing that I read about that I back, went back and rewatched. And uh, at that point, after reading about it, I could notice it. So 
it's certainly there. It's certainly noticeable if you know to look for it. Similar uh, to like the footsteps. Sometimes there are footsteps and again, I couldn't hear them, but I watched with subtitles so I could see when the subtitles said that there were footsteps. Um, but I think there's another thing. But again, this might just be a byproduct of me watching on 1.5 speed. There are times, there are, there are scenes in this movie, there are parts of this movie where there's just some kind of visual distortion going on. And it's not like that you see the outline of a man even. It's just that something kind of funky happens. And I went back in one of the scenes where it seemed really apparent to me. And I went back and I slowed it down and watched it in full speed to see if I could still notice anything in full speed. And like there, there was a window. Right. And so it might have just been the, you know, how like, you know, how like if a car drives by at night, there's just the light changes in the window. It might have been something like that. It certainly didn't look as obvious or as apparent as the first time I watched it on 1.5 speed. But then after rewatching it at regular speed, I went back again and watched it again on 1.5 speed. And then that time I didn't notice anything. So I don't know if that's a part of the movie that there are weird visual whatevers because in some of the scenes, but not all of them, they do have someone there in a green screen suit that they take out later. So it could be that we're seeing the distortion from that, or it could just be that when you play movies at faster speeds, you get weird distortion. I don't know. I, I'm so sorry. I'm like raising and, and lowering my sleeves because it's exactly the wrong temperature in here. It's not quite warm enough to be comfortable, but not quite cold enough for me to to be cold. I don't know. It's weird. So, yeah, that's 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 kind of weird. This this would be a good movie for me to actually watch on full speed. I just don't have time to do that right now. Uh, and then I wrote shadows, though, right? Because so in the other Invisible Man movies, he takes some kind of serum or chemical or drug or what have you. It just turns him invisible. And like the big differentiate, different, different, differentiation. The big point of difference in this one is that it's not biological, it's technological. He has a suit with hundreds of teeny tiny little cameras that project what they see on the other side. Like James Bond's car, right? Except. There would still be shadows, though. Right? Because, okay, say say behind me here. You can't see it on the camera. But there's, there we go. There's a shadow there, right? And so, like, even if there was a camera here that was picking up light from there and displaying it on a screen back there, A, it's probably not going to output the same amount of light because cameras don't put out that much light compared to a light bulb. But B, the angle's going to be off, right? So there should be some kind of shadow if his suit is just technological. And, like, I get that that makes it way more complicated of a movie to shoot and to do the effects for, but also to write. And it's just simpler to ignore the shadows. But, like, if we're going to get in the nitty-gritty, let's get in the nitty-gritty, right? There would be a shadow there. That would be a clue, and he would have to be aware of that and have to account for that. Um, and it's just it's not even mentioned; it's just completely ignored in the movie. I don't. I don't think. I don't think that the output screen would be able to perfectly mimic the input light. Also, like when you're standing on the floor. Right? The cameras that are looking at the floor, there's no light getting to them because you're in the way, right? But there's output screens putting out the light onto the floor that they're getting, but it's not going to be as much light. Like you'd see footprints. You'd see footprints. <sighs> it was probably smarter of them to ignore it. But I would like a movie that really, really gets into it and really overthinks things. Um, we get this weird line. I think it's from the sister where she's like explaining what she's gone through with Adrian. 
Or maybe it's even before that scene, but she said it's either the sister or James, who's like, I thought both times that I watched this movie that Emily and James were married and that Sydney was their daughter. But it might be that they're divorced. I mean, obviously they live in different places, but I thought that that was like an extra house that someone in James' family had and that's how they use it or whatever. But there's a deleted scene where James is like dating another woman. So I guess they're not together anymore. And like, does Sydney even have any scenes with Emily? Is Emily even her mom? I don't know. Anyway, not the point, but... Cecilia is talking to somebody and one of them asks, what did he do to you? And like, that's just a really weird way to ask that kind of question, right? She's clearly traumatized. She's clearly troubled. You're going to want to go more along the lines of like, do you want to talk about it? Do you want to tell me what happened, right? Give them the control, give them the power, give them the choice, right? Make it clear that you are welcoming and you are open and you are a safe person to talk to but when you say what did he do to you first of all you're demanding more from them which you don't want to do but second of all it just makes it sound like you're like interested in what happened or right? like oh what did he do to you like you like almost like you're more interested in him than you are caring about her it's a real small line and it's not focused on it's just that's not how we should we should talk to people who are dealing with things. Uh, the breath. The cold breath. That was in the trailer, right? I feel like I remember that from the trailer. Great way to, to get me interested. She's outside. It's cold. We see her breath. And we see the invisible man's breath. Chef's kiss. Mwah. Very good. Um, we get this idea that the brother, Tom, also hated... Adrian, which like turns out to not be true, but I think that was a very clever ploy by not only the brothers, but like the writers of the movie, right? Is to is to make us feel like, oh no, this guy's his brother, but he hates him too. He's on your side. He's not conspiring against you with his with his brother. No, 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 no. I think that works pretty effectively. Also, skipped over this one. She got mail at James's house and like she says a line about it, right? Nobody knows that I'm here. As you know, why why would I get mail? And then that is quickly forgotten because the mail is that he's dead and she's getting this inheritance. And so we move on to that scene where she's talking. But like we they should go back to that, right? And be like, how did anyone know that I was here? If I didn't tell anyone, and Emily didn't tell anyone, and James didn't tell anyone, and Sydney didn't tell anyone, the fact that I got mail here means that something is up, right? And that should have been a way bigger deal than it was, which was no deal at all. Uh, there's no way she hit you. So we kind of talked about this in the Abbott and Costello movie, but like that one was a comedy, so you're more willing to forgive it. But in this scene... In this movie, we have the scene where Cecilia is lying down sobbing on the floor. Sydney comes in to make her feel better. They're getting ready to go do something. And as Sydney is getting up, one of the invisible men just hits her in the face, right? And she thinks and says and claims to her father that Cecilia is the one that knocked her over. But it's just like, A, she's not close enough to you to reach you. B, she's not quick enough to move forward, smack you in the face, and then move back to where she was because she couldn't have done, she couldn't reach you without moving. And C, she's still on the floor. So, like, I get, I get that, like, if an invisible man hits you, that's not going to be your first go-to. But also, there's no way that she hit you. Right? And, like, that also shouldn't be your first go-to. Both things equally make no sense. So, uh, I don't know. That's just frustrating. Because, again, like in the Abbott and Costello movie, they could have framed it and shot it and blocked it in such a way that it could have been believable if they were on their way out. 
and Cecilia was behind Sydney, and Sydney got knocked from behind, right? That would make way more sense that she thinks that Cecilia did that. But in the configuration that they're in, the blocking that they're in, it's it's just not possible. So why would you even think that? <sighs> Daredevil. <laughs> Daredevil music. So a lot of the music in this sounds like the theme from the Daredevil Netflix show. And it might just be because I'm watching it sped up. So maybe at regular speed, that wouldn't be that noticeable. And it's like, it's not identical. It's not the same, but there's a little bit of that. Do, 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 do. It's in there. It's in there. Which like, Daredevil could be an invisible man because he can't see anyway. I doubt that's intentional. Uh, what does he want? So we kind of get answers to this later on in the movie. And like, I knew that. I still wrote it down though. What does Adrian want? Right? He doesn't want to kill her because he wants the baby. And he wants her to be with him, even though he knows she doesn't love him because he wants what he can't have. Right? It's that old story, which, like, overdone, cliche, sure. But, like, I don't understand why he does the things that he does as the Invisible Man. Why does he take pictures of her and then hide them in the house and then like lead her to I guess he doesn't lead her to the attic she calls his phone and it's in the attic but it's like you left it on vibrate and you set it on the, the, the floor so you must have not been upset at the idea of her finding it uh so it's like, why, why did he take the picture? She finds him. It's weird. She's creeped out and scared that he's been there. But, like, she's already scared and creeped out that he's there. Does that really add anything? I don't know. Uh, he took the knife in that one scene when she's making breakfast. And then just hides, puts it in a bag and hides it in the attic. Again, what's that for? Why did he put the knife there? Did he think that she would just be scared to see a knife? Like, that's weird. And he he turned the heat up on the whatever she was making so it caught on fire. Would it catch on fire? I feel like probably not. But I don't know. But So he, like, starts this fire, essentially, but it's, like, easily put out with the fire extinguisher, right? Chekhov's fire extinguisher, which we'll get back to. Uh, but, like... If he wanted to, you know, start a fire, he could have just started a fire. He didn't need to, like, trick it. And, like, yeah, he wants her to go... He wants her... He wants her to think that she's the crazy one. He wants everyone else to also think that she's the crazy one. But, like... Why do things that could have been an accident? Right? Like, burning food. Instead of just creating a fire out of nowhere that would make you feel more crazy right if my couch just spontaneously lit on fire i would be more weirded out by that than if food that i was cooking and accidentally caught on fire so it's one of those things where it's like what's actually happening is for the audience's benefit and they have to try to justify why the characters are making the choices that they're doing and it's like probably best to just let it go instead of ranting about it for several minutes like I have been, but I don't know. I don't know. I overthink things. Uh, paint is good. So, we've talked in all these other movies about dumb ways that these people have to try to fight invisible men. The paint is a good option, especially for how quickly she gets to it. Uh, and I, I swear, I watched this twice, and I still didn't put together what happened until I was reading about it in IMDb Trivia. So we're getting into, like, heavy spoilers now here. They're both, both of the brothers are being the Invisible Man the whole movie. Right? So, like, we see him get covered in paint, which is good because she can see it, and it leaves a trail for a while. And then we see the sink where he's starting to wash the paint off. But if you're like me, then you were kind of like, the paint doesn't wash off 
all that easily, especially for a suit that's like as complex and complicated as, as that one is. It's going to get into spots. So how is he suddenly so completely invisible again? Not even any water is visible. It's because there's two of them, right? And one of them got the paint on and the other one didn't. So paint was a good option. Uh, the breath for the hair. <laughs> Oh, I skipped the coffee, though. Because she starts putting coffee grounds on the floor. And I wrote, not coffee, flour. Use flour. Because coffee, again, flour, three benefits. One, when it's on the floor, it'll pick up any footsteps on the floor. Two, it lingers, right? So you're going to see shapes and stuff in physical space because it lingers. And three, it sticks to stuff. And even if you're trying to wash it off, it's going to smear. And like, yeah, you can eventually wash it off, obviously. But like, it's going to be more problematic to wash off than coffee grounds, which are just on the floor. They're not lingering anywhere. They're not going to get stuck to you. Very easy to brush off. But even when they're on the floor, it's like if you don't slide your feet through them, if you just step on top, you could maybe see as they're being stepped on. But like if she's watching this spot and he comes walking over on the other side and he gets to the other side, I don't know that you'd be able to see spots that were previously stepped on. Also, there's a like a gap all the way around because she doesn't c cover, you know, the furniture and everything. So there's like a gap where you could easily walk between. Why coffee? You've got the right idea, just the wrong thing. And you're in the kitchen. You're going to tell me there's no flour in that kitchen? Gosh, come on. So the paint is much better. Uh, then she gets outside and I wrote, why did she stop running? She hired an Uber, I guess, or something like that. It got there very quickly. But like, why would you stop running? If you are running out of a house, being chased by an invisible man who you cannot see, why would you stop running until you get in that car? Why would you stop running? I don't know. Uh, the throat slit. This was like, I remember this in the theater. And, like, I was already in on this movie, right? I was already invested. I was already, like, yeah, this is scary. Yeah, this is terrifying. Yeah, I get it. But, man, that throat slit scene, I don't know what it is about it, but that just, like, boom, bumped it up to another level real quick. It's just so fast. And, like, you have to try to process what's happening, which is the same thing that Cecilia is going through at the time. Although I did write down, put the knife down because like I get that you're processing stuff but you know that that's not gonna look good right put it down then process stuff but like even on even this when I watched it again I, I had already seen it I knew it was coming I watched it again I saw it happen again and I still went back and rewound it to watch it again because it's just it's so good it's so out of nowhere I watched it a couple times actually because I was trying to figure out why her hand would have been up and it does seem like he just pulled her hand up. And, like, if your hand's on the table, right, your hand's going to be open. You're not going to, like, have a closed fist most of the time naturally. So he pulls her hand up, sticks it there, and then you just kind of instinctively grab onto something that gets put into your hand. So all of that, I think, makes really good sense. I think they shot it really well. Just put the knife down. What are you doing? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. My next note is, why well, struggle? So, again, I know she's processing what's going on here. And she's grieving and she's mourning the loss of her sister. But, like, you gotta be aware of, I'm sorry, but the optics of it all. You have this entire restaurant who now thinks that you've murdered this person. You have the police there who have been told that you've murdered this person. And you know, you gotta know. That if you are, I don't want to say hysterical, because I know that that word has some sexist overtones, undertones, origins. But if you are um, just like screaming and panting and struggling and saying things like, he's right there, you can't see him, he's invisible, he's after me. If you are saying these things that you know... That somebody that does not understand the full situation is not going to believe 
You've got to know that that's going to look bad. So, excuse me. I get that she doesn't want to be arrested or convicted for her sister's murder, but, like, you gotta, you gotta chill. You gotta play it cool. Just go with the people. Don't act like someone who's lost their mind, right? Follow instructions. Let them know that you are sane. Let them know that you are aware of what's going on. And she's just, she's really, she's really hurt in her own case here. Uh, and like, you know, it's really easy for me to, to sit here and say, you know, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta do that, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. And I get that she's like, she's she's having a moment, but like, at some point that moment's gotta end and you gotta, you gotta play the game, right? You gotta know what it looks like and you gotta alter your behavior to match how you want other people to see you because they don't know what's going on, right? <sighs> okay, uh, the bro don't know what surprise means. So <laughs> he, he texts surprise to the phone when she's up looking at the phone and it's like, that's not a surprise. She already looked at the pictures. Like if, if the phone like lock screen or whatever had said surprise and then she opened it and then she saw the pictures, yeah, that wouldn't have been surprising, but like he texted it afterwards. So that's really weird. But then she gets arrested or whatever and put into this facility, into her little room, and everyone else leaves and he just goes, surprise. That's not a surprise, my guy. That's annoying and inconvenient and is going to cause problems for her, but like, that's not a surprise. Do you, you don't know what a surprise is, my guy. Um, okay, okay, okay. Uh, why is James on this case? So, James is there interrogating her with someone else after Emily has died. And again, unless I totally misread something, James and Emily were at some point an item, right? Am I, am I making that up? Is that coming out of nowhere? I'm pretty sure. And I feel like he wouldn't be put on that case, right? Because not only is he close to the suspect, but he was at least at one point close to the victim. So it seems like he's not going to be the most uh, objective person to put on that case. So I feel like that would be one of those cliche cop situations where they're like, you're, clo you're too close to this. you got to put someone else on it. doesn't make sense that he's working that case. He's also, like, insanely chill about the whole thing. Uh, do -do, right now you're a murderer, but I can change that. So Tom goes to meet Cecilia while she's in the facility. And he tells her this offer of if you go back with Adrian, all this goes away. And he says the line, right now you're a murderer, but I can change that. How? How are you going to change the fact that everyone thinks that she killed Emily? Right? Because, like, there's security footage, but you can't change that footage, right? People can look at it, and people can either say there's no other explanation other than that she killed her, or people can say something about this looks weird. She's not holding the knife when it slits her throat. Either of those things are irrelevant to you and Adrian, right? The only, the only thing that you could do is to have Adrian confess, or to have Tom confess. I guess I don't know which one of them did it, but, like, have one of them confess, right? And say, actually, no, I was wearing this suit. Here it is. Here's how it works, and you can believe me, and I did it. But that doesn't seem like what he's putting on the table, right? Certainly not for Adrian, because the whole point is that Adrian wants to have Cecilia come back with him. So if he's in prison, that's not going to work. So is Tom suggesting that he would confess, and he would take the fall for the murder? If Cecilia would go back to Adrian? I don't think so. So what does this line mean? What is it supposed to mean? What exactly are you implying, Mr. Tom? Can't take my name. Uh, the fire extinguisher. So we had the fire extinguisher show up earlier in the movie. Comes back later as 
both of the Invisible Men are attacking Sydney. So this is another thing that I had to go back and rewatch after reading about it, because even after watching it twice, I didn't pick up on it. Sydney pepper sprays one of them. I guess probably Adrian. I don't know. I can't remember everything that happens. But she's pepper sprays one of them. He like stumbles over. She runs out the room. And I thought that she got grabbed from behind, but no, she runs into the other one and falls backwards. So both of them are there at that scene. As with probably several other scenes. Right? That also explains how after uh, the suit was damaged by the pen and all the water and the rain that like then it can seem completely invisible in another scene because there's multiple people and there's multiple suits. <sighs> Fire extinguisher though. Good call because you can see his figure in it. Um, it's not going to stick to the people though. I read that it doesn't do it as much so they had to fake it in the movie but like even before I wouldn't have thought that it's going to stick to you as much as flowers, so I still think flowers better, but fire extinguisher better than coffee grounds for sure. It's probably also going to disorient them, which is good. Quick and brutal. I skipped over that note. So in the mental health care facility, asylum, whatever it was supposed to be, this hallway scene with all these people going down, you know, uh, Nando had a lot of points about how to fight an invisible man, but I think what really works in this scene is that he doesn't give these guys a chance to realize that they are fighting an invisible man. He's quick, he's brutal, he's obviously a very fit person, so he's very strong, he's got the element of surprise, he's using their guns against them. Very effective at taking these people out. Uh, here's a weird note. Again, I watch this with subtitles. And whenever she calls a phone, it says that the line is trilling. And for a while, I didn't realize what that meant. I was like, is it making a weird noise? Like, I don't understand what that means. But then I realized that they are using that instead of the word ringing. And this is one of those generational things where phones used to literally ring with a bell. But now they don't. Now it's just, you know... A digital sound and this is one of those this is one of those things that like younger people are not going to understand why we say that the phone is ringing younger people are not going to understand when we say oh I left it on your answering machine as opposed to a voicemail younger people do not understand why we say oh I'm gonna roll the window down in my car right younger people don't understand why the save icon on your computer programs looks like a floppy disk. And I'm just like, are we at that point where we don't say that the phone rings anymore? We say that it trills? I don't know. Uh, she heard his voice. Okay, so I feel like I thought this was supposed to be a super obvious thing, but I haven't seen a whole lot else about it. But like, after Tom dies, right? And the pe other people are in the movie are like, no, Adrian's dead. It was Tom that was doing it to you this whole time. And she's like, no, it was Adrian's involved too. I know it. She never brings up the fact that she heard the invisible man talking to her. Uh, and like, in general, like me, I don't know these two guys, right? I'm just watching this movie. I wouldn't be able to tell you 100% which voice is Tom's and which voice is Adrian's. And when we hear the Invisible Man speak, I wouldn't be able to tell you 100% whose voice that is. But you would think that somebody that's been married to someone for so long would be able to identify his voice, right? It's not like they're twins that have the same voice or something. And man, I could go on a tangent here about how somebody urinated on my door when I was in college and I didn't physically see who did it, but I could hear them talking about it later on. They were talking to their friends about how they did it and I could identify them by their voice and the people in charge of discipline at the school did not take that as strong enough evidence. And I'm like, you're telling me that there aren't people that you can recognize their voice? You're telling me you can't recognize Gilbert Gottfried's voice or Morgan Freeman's voice or, I don't know, Jim Gaffigan's voice? Like, there are certain people that have distinctive voices and this person was one of them and I'm telling you, that was his voice talking about it. But that's not what we're talking about right now. I just think it's weird that it's never brought up 
that she doesn't say it to other people. Other people don't ask about it. It's never brought up that she literally heard him speaking and she would have known that it was Adrian's voice. Then later, when Adrian is back, you know, not tied up anymore, she comes over for dinner. He's like acting like the nice guy, right? And he, he says this line, right? Like, you couldn't be surprised by that or whatever. And like, it seems like that's supposed to be an intentional clue to us, the audience, right? But, like, that scene, the sound is different. And I rewound it again to double check and just the sound mix, whatever. It's different when he says that line than either of the lines surrounding it. And I couldn't figure out why that was. And I was like, is that supposed to be some subtle clue that it, it wasn't him? Like, I don't know. I read in the IMDb trivia that that one line of dialogue was added afterwards for some reason. So, like, that's probably why it sounds different, is it wasn't actually shot there with the rest of the scene. It was added in later. And I probably wouldn't have noticed without my headphones on. But, like, that was just weird. Uh, and then I wrote, no follow-up on the invisibility suit, because, again, by this point, the police have evidence of this inv invisibility suit. They have proof that it exists. They have proof that it works. James is a witness. James, the police officer, is a witness. <coughs> Excuse me. But, like, apparently Adrian was never brought in for questioning about why did you invent this? What were your plans for it? Does anybody else have one? Like, all of that is just skimmed over. And I guess that doesn't mean that that didn't happen. But it's completely skimmed over. And it's just like, yep, okay, you invented this thing. It's extremely dangerous. Uh, yeah, you're good to go. Not only that, you invented this thing that's extremely dangerous and your spouse has reported that you have abused her. Yeah, you're good to go. It just, it just seemed like it's way too glossed over. And by way too glossed over, I mean it's not addressed at all. Seems like it should have been a big deal. And then, like, she just walks out with it at the end. And it's like, you know, sequel? Hopefully. I'd love a sequel to this. But, like, you telling me that the police aren't, like, seizing all of those? Those seem like you wouldn't be able to... You wouldn't be allowed to have those. I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, it's it shouldn't have been glossed over. Because that shouldn't be the big question that I have at the end. Uh, so let's talk about fighting this guy. First of all, there's two of them. Second of all, they're both fit and strong and quick. So I feel like for most of the people in this movie, uh, you wouldn't have much of a chance, right? Now, let's, let's give as many benefits of the doubt as we can. Let's say we're only fighting one. Let's say we know that we're fighting an invisible man. Uh, and let's say that... Um, I don't know. I guess just those two things, right? So we know we're fighting this invisible man. Uh, what was the other thing I said? Oh, and there's only one. Let's say there's only one, okay? Again, you got to go with the flower, right? Fire extinguisher was okay. Paint was okay. But, like, the flower, it's giving you footsteps. It's giving you tracks. It's giving you their space and the linger. It's also going to... Disrupt how much they can see in you, right? Maybe not a lot, right? Flowers is not like a smoke screen, but if they're relying on cameras, if you get any little specks on those cameras, that's going to disorient them. And then, as I said, difficult to clean off, especially when you've got all those divots in that suit. So you get some flower bombs going off. Then it's just a fight, right? It's just a fight with that guy. Now, I probably couldn't take anybody in a fight because i am a weak little pathetic man but let's say it's an average joe fighting this guy if you got your flower there i mean you just i guess i don't know which cameras he's seeing through i would assume it's up by his eyes so that he gets the correct you know angle and altitude so i mean i feel like you just take a handful of that flower and you just smear it all in his face then he can't see nothing but even if that's not uh, how he gets his vision, 
You're just you're just fighting a god. So then it just comes down to can you fight a guy or not? Um, so I certainly think it's possible to beat this invisible man, but I do think it'd be the most difficult out of all of them because he seems like he knows how to fight, whereas this one just strangles people, and that one gets knocked out multiple times, and this one is like going crazy, so it has some like rage strength going for him. Um, but like they use that to trick him, right? They, they trick him into an electrical box at one point. So I do think this one is the most dangerous, but if you're a competent fighter and you've got flour on hand, I could see it, it possible that you take it out. But let's, let's rank these. Uh, easiest one to fight, this one. Gets knocked out all the time. Even though he's a boxer, he, he knocks, he gets knocked out multiple times on accident in the movie. Next one is this guy, because he'll 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 go for the jugular, he'll strangle you, but like all you gotta do is just fight back, and like some people do some good fighting back in this one, uh, but this one all you gotta do is fight back, and you take that guy. This guy, I feel like could be a pretty big threat, but he doesn't seem as stealthy, uh, and because he's consumed by this madness that's taking him uh, over. He's not going to be as smart about it. So I do think this is going to be the hardest one to fight for sure by far. So Nando, you can, you can have him. I don't want to, I don't want to take him on. Um, but still though, flower would help a lot. Is there an invisible movie, uh, invisible man movie where someone uses flower and it doesn't work? I'd like to, I'd like to check that out. Uh, they use flower in paranormal activity, but that's just for footsteps. Because it's not an invisible man. It's a demon. Although the fight scenes in this look very similar to things that happen in paranormal activity. But that's going to do it for my invisible man uh, ranking series collection, whatever you want to call it. So we got two days of October left. Uh, we're looking at Creature of the Black Lagoon. I'm going to do a bonus video, I think, on this TV special of Abbott and Costello. I don't know how long it is, so I don't think I'll get a full video out of it. Uh, that might go up on my Patreon, if you want to check that out. It might go up on the regular channel. I don't know yet. I'll have to wait until I watch it. Uh, and then Monday, for Halloween, the plan is to look at uh, Shape of Water, which is like the modern, serious take on... Gill man, as he's called. So that's what's next. But thank you for watching this. I got a lot of I got a lot of horror stuff on the channel. If you haven't been keeping up with everything I've been doing, I've got over 100 videos talking about horror movies, including classic Universal monsters, including a lot of Abbott Costello stuff, including more modern interpretations of stuff. There's a lot. There's a lot on there. A lot of franchise stuff. We've got Halloween movies. There's going to be another Halloween video going up on my Patreon on Halloween talking about the uh, the Jamie Lloyd series. So Halloween 2, 4, 5, and 6, I believe. Uh, we got some Friday the 13th movies up. We've got Nightmare on Elm Street. We've got a couple Hellraisers, Children on the Corn, all the Scream movies. We got a lot of franchise stuff up here. So uh, that's going to do it for this one. Thank you for watching. Have a good day. And keep some flour in your kitchen for some Invisible Man action. Goodbye.